Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. It is a great and wonderful thing that we worship our gracious and loving God, whether we're doing that online or in person uh, here in our worship space. And uh, happy Father's Day to all fathers present today. Let's uh, begin our time of worship in prayer. Gracious and loving Lord, what a wonderful thing it is that you invite us into your family through your son, Jesus Christ. And though, uh, Lord, it's a struggle for us sometimes to fully realize what a great, wonderful, and loving Father you are to us. We pray that as we gather for worship this morning, you would help us to grow in doing that, that you would help us to come before you as your beloved, forgiven children and look to you, crying out for whatever it is that we need, knowing that you are already leaning forward to give us what you know is best. And so bless us, Lord, as we worship, and we ask that you would be glorified among us this day. And we ask all these things in the holy and precious name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Let us confess our sins to God and receive the free and full forgiveness that he gives to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. Gracious and I often try to live a self-reliant, self-directed life, and then I wonder why I fall short of the rich, full, abundant life that you want to give to me. Give me eyes to see the greater vision that you have for my life. Help me to see that you are inviting me to partner with you in life by relying on your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask for your forgiveness. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Dear friends, I have good news for you. Not only has Jesus taken away all of your sin, guilt, and shame, and given you forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life with him, he has also given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will rise up within you like a river of living water, quenching your thirst for all that you really need in life. Things like peace, forgiveness, a new identity, and a new life. As you rely on the Holy Spirit, he will direct your life so that it reflects God's life-giving love into the world around you. Because of all that Jesus has done for you, I assure you that you are completely forgiven by God. Rest in the peace and the joy of your salvation. Amen. Our first song.
we come together today, we bring our burdens, we bring our cares, we bring our joys. Let's leave them all at Jesus' feet.
Today's first reading is from Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 to chapter 4, verse 7. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time, set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Today's second reading is from John chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hi everyone. Today we celebrate Father's Day. So happy Father's Day out there to everyone that's a dad or an uncle or a grandpa or maybe a coach. To all the men out there that really are good examples for us. A lot of people when we think about Father's Day, we think about our Heavenly Father and how much God loves us. And sometimes I think we have a hard time with that. How can we be lovable when maybe we're not always good or maybe when we have a bad attitude and yet God still loves us? Well, I have a couple of pictures here. One, this is baby Timothy. And this one here, that's baby Michelle. Aren't they cute? So I heard a man talking about it. Fathers love their children, their babies. But you know what? Babies aren't always lovable. Sometimes they're crying. And sometimes, well, they have dirty diapers and they stink and they need to be cleaned up. But it doesn't change how a father loves that child. And that's exactly how our Father in Heaven loves us too. He loves us so much, even when we don't do things always right. And maybe we're a little bit smelly in the way that we are in our attitudes. 
and God always loves us and we can always go to him and ask for his forgiveness. So on this special Father's Day, I want each one of you to remember how much your Heavenly Father loves you. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, on this day, we thank you for dads and grandpas and uncles and the men in our lives that give such a good example of what your love is. But mostly we thank you that you love us unconditionally and that we can always come to you, ask for forgiveness, and we know that you are there for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, there is no Sunday school, but there is some activity bags over on the side. And if you'd like to use one of those, there's some coloring pages and maybe some other things for you to do. As well, there's some little bags of crayons. Have a great day, everyone. During the month of June, we are thanking God for the volunteers that he provides to do the ministry of this church, the ministry that we do together, and we couldn't do it without those many, many volunteers. And so uh, please join with me as we pray for the volunteers that we're going to be recognizing today. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people that you have gathered together in this uh, community of faith, one small subset of your universal church. We thank you, Lord, for each person and how you have given to each one a gift, a talent, an ability that they can share and use in ministry. And so on this day, we thank you, Lord, for all those who are serving as young adult leader, leaders. We pray that you would bless Dave E., Chris K., Tara, Rhonda, and Angelina. Uh, bless also our youth leaders, Kathleen, Juliana, Michelle P., Jeremy, Zach, Brittany, Rebecca, Tiana, David H., Reese, Dave E., Carson, Rhonda, Mark, Alexander, Erica, Jennifer, Chris B., and Chris K., Bless also our confirmation leader, Lisa O, and all those who are serving in positions of leadership uh, on our senior ministry team, uh, Chris K, Mike E, Kathleen, James, me. Oh, that's a different James. Anyway, Laura, Carol, Jillian, and me for sure this time. Uh, the governing board, uh, Ryan V, Jackie, Michelle P, Lisa O, uh, Steve G, Susan E, and Kurt. And also, Lord, for those who are serving on our settlement ministry, which is, has helped to settle the Arshad family and is helping to settle the Treek family. Uh, bless Ryan J, Samantha, Tony, Jane, Brian V, Nadine V, Amy O, Joel O, Pastor Carl and Arshad. And Lord, uh, as we do the work together that you have called us to do, we pray that your kingdom would grow and you would be glorified among us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, because it's Father's Day, we have root beer for the men. It will be chilled and waiting for you by the exit. Uh, or uh, if you're fortunate, someone might deliver it to you, but that'll be after the service. So just hold your thirst until then. And at this time, I'd like to invite Matteo to come up and um, make another announcement. Hello, hello. I'm just wanting to remind you guys about this coming Saturday, 7 p.m. We've got a, a dance fundraiser happening here at the church. Um, just Reminding you, inviting you all to uh, come join us and uh, support the uh, work we're hoping to do in Africa this coming January.
today's message. Sermon notes on our church app. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, what a wonderful thing it is that you speak to us through your word. And we pray, Lord, that as we reflect on your word this morning, you would help us to hear what it is that you are saying to us. That you would plant your word deep in our hearts and help us to live by it. For you indeed have the words of eternal life. We ask these things in the holy and precious name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. So today is the third sermon in the Living Waters series. And in John chapter 7, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as being like rivers of living water that flow from within us. And so during the month of June, we are reflecting on uh, who the Holy Spirit is and how he quenches uh, our deepest thirsts. Could you imagine what it would be like to forget who you really are? Now, this kind of uh, thing is called amnesia, and it actually happens. So, for example, in March 2015, actor Harrison Ford uh, was in a plane crash. He was flying a vintage plane, and uh, he uh, suffered amnesia. He remembers the special landing instructions that the air traffic controllers gave him just before he tried to land. But after that, he couldn't remember anything for five days until he woke, woke up in hospital. And then in 2008, 32-year-old mother Naomi Jacobs woke up one morning and could not recall 17 years of memories. She thought she was 15 years old. She did not recognize her 10-year-old son, uh, but she could remember phone numbers and how to drive. Using detailed diaries that she had kept, she was able to rebuild her forgotten memories, and within uh, eight weeks, most of her memory had returned. Now, when a person experiences amnesia in life, it can be very disorientating. However, if the amnesia is extensive or permanent, or if the ability to form new memories is lost, which can sometimes happen when there's brain damage, it can be very debilitating. The who you are that amnesia wipes out is called identity. And the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines identity as the distinguishing characteristic or personality of an individual. One of the main goals in life for a human being is to discover and develop one's own identity. Now, most of that quest happens during the teenage and young adult years, uh, but questions of identity can come up at other times of life, especially when a major life change like a divorce or a retirement happens. Now, most of us are able to successfully navigate that quest for identity and go through our adult years with some kind of a stable sense of who we are. But here's a question that I'm asking you to consider. Is the sense of who you are secure enough to get you through a life-changing challenge? So for example, if your identity is built on what you do, then what's going to happen to you when you retire or if you lose your job? Or if your identity is built on how you look, what will happen when your looks begin to change over time? Or if your identity is built on your stuff, what will happen when you lose your stuff? Or if it's built on your key relationships, what's, going to, what's life going to be like for you when you lose one or more of those key relationships, either through a break in that relationship or through death? Now, please keep in mind, all of us, to some extent, build our identity upon these things. But I'm talking about your core identity, who you are deep down at the center of your being. I'm talking about that sense of identity that drives you in all of your other various realms of life, like what you do and how you look and what you have and how you relate to others. That's what I'm talking about. And here's how to get at what your core identity really is, because we may not even be aware of it. 
If all of the things that could be taken away from you in life were stripped away, who would you really be? I'm suggesting to you that your soul and mine, both of us thirst for a secure identity at our core. We want to know that no matter what happens to us, the I, the I who we really are, will be okay. And when you and I are able to have that kind of a secure personal identity, then, then we are able to live the rich, full, abundant life that Jesus wants to give to us. But how do we have a personal identity so secure that we know we will be okay, even if everything in our life is stripped away? That is what we're going to be thinking about this morning as we dig into the Bible. And our reflection will begin by going back to the very beginning. In Genesis 2, 7, we read, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Human beings are unique amongst all of God's uh, creatures. We have physical bodies, but we are also spiritual beings. With the breath of God breathed into us, we have become enfleshed souls. That is, souls that live in a physical body. And both men and women, the Bible tells us, are created in the image of God. This means that God has made an impression upon us when he created us. And therefore, we are like him in significant ways. And we reflect some of God's goodness and love and other qualities back to him and into the world around us. We were made for a relationship with God. And Genesis chapters 1 and 2 paint for us a picture of what that relationship should be like, ideally. The first humans lived in paradise, in an idyllic and fruitful garden where all their needs were met. They had a close, intimate relationship with God, and there was no barrier of any kind between humans and God. And then the fall happened when our first parents disobeyed God, and their sin disrupted the relationship between humans and God, corrupted the goodness that God had put into creation when he made it, and distorted all of humanity, both body and soul. And that's why God gave us the law, a written declaration of what we human beings should and should not do. And the law is most clearly expressed in the Ten Commandments. And God gave us those Ten Commandments because he loves us and he wants what is best for us. The Ten Commandments are like the boundaries of a soccer field. As long as we stay inside the lines, we have freedom to live wholesome, fruitful lives. But God has something more for us than a life lived in accordance with the Ten Commandments, even though that is a good thing. Now, to see how we can receive God's greater life, let's take a look at our main passage for today, which is Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 to chapter 4, verse 7. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to turn there now. And what we find there is that Paul, in his letter to the Christians in Galatia, is using the language of inheritance law to describe our transition to abundant life with God. And a key aspect of that transition is identity. Paul writes, Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come, this faith in Jesus Christ, would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. Now this faith has come, now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So a guardian, as uh, many of you will know, is someone who's appointed to look after the personal interests of another person. Parents may designate a guardian in their will for their children, and that guardian would look after their children should both parents die. Now Paul is saying that the law is like a guardian that God has put in place to look after us 
until the time was right for us to receive the full rights of our inheritance. Now, this is where the issue of identity rises, because inheritance is tied to one's identity. Only a person who's listed in someone's will is entitled to receive the bequest that is left to them. You have to be exactly the right person in that will in order to receive the inheritance that is listed there. Now, right at this point, we hit just the slightest amount of honest self-awareness. We'll realize that they are not the right person to receive any good thing from God. We would like to think that we really are, but we all know that deep down inside of us, we aren't. So we try. We try to build an identity for ourselves that says we are a good person, worthy of receiving good things from God. We try to overlook the failures in our past and the flaws in our present and the frightful possibilities in our future. But that only creates cognitive dissonance in our mind. And our muddled minds make it even less likely that we will ever receive abundant life from God. We cannot pretend to be someone that we really aren't. But God has the solution to our identity problem. He knows that our broken sinful nature causes us to base our identity on the wrong things. He knows that we hurt ourselves and others as we try to cover up who we really are and pretend that we are someone who we are not. He knows that we struggle to accept our own flaws and failures because they cannot fit into any kind of socially acceptable identity in this world as the world sees it. And God also knows that on our own, our sin-stained soul cannot have anything to do with a pure, holy God. And yet God loves us just as we are with a pure, unconditional, self-giving love. So how can that impassable gap between us and God be bridged? Well, God has bridged that gap for us. God the Father sent his son Jesus into this world to become fully human so he could undo all of the damage done by sin. Jesus lived a perfect human life that counts as our life for everyone who looks to Jesus in faith. And then when the time was just right, because he loves us, Jesus willingly went to the cross to suffer and die for all the sins in all the world throughout all time. Jesus paid the full cost of forgiveness for all the bad things that we have done and for all the good things that we have failed to do. Jesus essentially switched identities with us and suffered in our place for our sin and brokenness so that we can live in his place with all of his righteousness in purity. This is what it means to live in Christ. We accept ourselves with all of our sin and brokenness because we trust that God really has forgiven us. And then we live our lives in this world trusting that the righteousness and purity of Jesus applies fully to us because we are living our lives in him. Now, a few years ago, Wagner Hills Farm had a side business called Covenant Coverings. And I always thought that that was a great name for a business like that because it's such a beautiful picture of what Jesus has done for us and continues to do for us. When we live in Jesus, we are living in a pure white tent that he has provided for us. A tent that shelters us from all of the guilt and shame that tends to rain down on us because of our sin and brokenness. And in this tent, we are surrounded by Jesus' righteousness and purity. And we can celebrate in this tent with all of our fellow followers of Jesus because all of us have this new identity in him as beloved, forgiven children of God. And we have this new identity because of a covenant Jesus made with each one of us at our baptisms. There Jesus washed us clean of all of our sin, bound us to himself with a bond that he will never break, gave us a new life with him that will last forever, and adopted us into the family of God. Living in Christ 
means living under the covenant covering that he has given to us. Living in Christ means living with the new identity that he has given us as beloved, forgiven children of God. Living in Christ means living as heirs to the future fullness of God's kingdom, which will be revealed when Jesus comes back to this world to make us and all things right. That's when all of the corrupting effects of sin will be healed in all of creation. And we will be raised from the dead with new resurrection bodies that will never grow old, get sick, or die. Death will be defeated. Evil will be banished. Heaven and earth will be reunited. And we will live in that combined new heaven and earth forever. We will see Jesus with our own eyes. And we will adore and worship him into eternity. Now, with all the problems in the world these days, it may seem almost trivial to distill the good news of Jesus down to a simple sentence like the one that I'm going to say. But it's true. Because of Jesus, in the end, everything will be good. And if things are not good, all it means is that it's not the end yet. And so we live in the now and the not yet. Right now, because of Jesus, we are beloved, forgiven children of God. Right now, because of Jesus, we are covered by his righteousness and purity. Right now, we are new creation people who live and move and have our being in this world through the relationship that we have with Jesus. But our struggle against the sin in our soul and in the world around us is not yet complete. Our transformation into becoming like Jesus is not fully done. The paradise for which we all long, which has no more death or mourning or crying or pain, has not yet arrived. And our heart longs for these things to come and to come soon. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, there's one more gift given to us in baptism, which I have not yet mentioned. And that gift makes all of the difference in the world to us as we go through the challenges of living as God's people in a broken and hurting world. And that gift is the Holy Spirit. God tells us through Paul, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Now, the word sons in this passage is more of a technical term. It doesn't really apply to or refer to gender. And what it's saying is that we are both male and female heirs uh, to God's kingdom. Because in ancient times, only sons could inherit. But through Jesus, all of us, both male and female, inherit the kingdom of God. And because Jesus has made us heirs and children of God, God the Father has given us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit quenches our thirst for an unshakable new identity by helping us to see who we really are. Beloved, forgiven children of God and heirs of the kingdom of God. It is the Holy Spirit who enables us to look to our Heavenly Father in faith and cry out, Abba, Father. Now, we're not talking about a Swedish music group from the 70s. Uh, This is an ancient Aramaic term uh, that was used when one has an intimate personal relationship with their father. It's kind of like our English word, Daddy. And it's the word that Jesus used when he prayed to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to know and live in the close, personal, intimate, loving relationship with our Heavenly Father that Jesus has given to us. And then, it is through our relationship with our Heavenly Father that we are able to live as His children in this broken and hurting world. It's from our Heavenly Father that we receive the resources, courage, and direction we need for each day. It is from our Heavenly Father that we receive the comfort, encouragement, and hope we need when circumstances turn our lives upside down. 
Our Heavenly Father is always leaning forward to answer our prayer whenever we cry out, Abba, Father. And all these things we know objectively are true because Jesus rose from the dead. And we know that they are personally true for us because Jesus has given us the living water of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit assures us that God the Father really does love us, that Jesus really does forgive us, and that he, the Holy Spirit, really does live within us. In his book, Abba's Child, Brennan Manning writes, several years ago, I directed a parish renewal in Clearwater, Florida. The morning after it ended, the pastor invited me to his home for breakfast. Sitting on my plate was an envelope containing a brief note from a member of the church. It brought tears to my eyes. Dear Brennan, in all my 83 years, I have never had an experience like this. During your week of renewal here at St. Cecilia's, you promised that if we attended each night, our lives would be changed. Mine has. Last week, I was terrified at the prospect of dying. Tonight, I am homesick for the house of my Abba. Continuing on, Manning writes, in his human journey, Jesus experienced God in a way that no prophet of Israel ever dreamed or dared. Jesus was indwelt by the Spirit of the Father and given a name for God that would scandalize both the theology and public opinion of Israel, the name that escaped the mouth of the Nazarene carpenter, Abba. Jewish children used this intimate colloquial form of speech in addressing their fathers. And Jesus himself employed it with his foster father, Joseph. As a term for divinity, however, it was unprecedented not only in Judaism, but in any of the world's uh, great world religions. Joachim Jeremiah wrote, Abba as a way of addressing God is an authentic utter, original utterance of Jesus. We are confronted with something new and astounding. Here lies the great novelty of the gospel. Jesus, the beloved son, does not hoard this experience for himself. He invites and calls us to share the same intimate and liberating relationship. So the challenge that I'm leaving with you today is this, to tell yourself each day who you are in Jesus. We tend to forget that Satan loves to whisper lies in our ears, which if we believe them will pull us away from God. We have a kind of amnesia as we go through life, forgetting who we are in Jesus. And so we need to vigorously counteract the lies of our enemy and our own forgetfulness by continually telling ourselves who we are in Jesus. And what does that look like? Well, you could use, if you want, words like this. Because of Jesus, I am a beloved, forgiven child of God. And I am loved, accepted, and valued just as I am. And so I invite you to practice by saying these words again together with me. Because of Jesus, I am a beloved, forgiven child of God. And I am loved, accepted, and valued just as I am. As you grow and live in your new identity in Jesus, you will find that your sense of who you are will never be shaken, regardless of what happens to you. The Holy Spirit will keep reminding you that you are a beloved, forgiven of child of God. And that identity can never be taken away from you. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for making us children of God. And dear Holy Spirit, we pray that you would help us to live as we really are. And dear Father, we pray that you would help us to see who we are in your loving eyes. Bless us, we pray, and help us to be a blessing to the world around us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church, our vision is to be a church 
that helps people of all generations to be passionate about, equipped for, and effective at transforming lives for the kingdom of God. If you would like to partner with us financially in this work that we're doing together, there's several ways you can do that. You can give online at wglc.org slash donate, or if you want to set up an ongoing giving relationship uh, with us, you can do that by emailing our church office at admin at wglc.org, and we'd be glad to set that up for you. Or if you brought your offering uh, with you today, there's a basket on the side table, and you could place it in there as you go. But this time, I invite you to stand if you're able, and let us confess the faith that we share in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's remain standing and lift our prayers to our Abba Father, knowing that he hears us and answers with his love. Gracious and loving Lord, we lift up to you our broken and hurting world. We pray for peace in all areas of the world where there is war or violence. We especially pray for peace for the people of Ukraine. We ask, Lord, that you would bring that conflict to an end. We pray for wisdom for leaders around the world as they seek to deal with this challenging situation. We pray for comfort for those who are grieving, healing for those who are wounded, and restoration for those who have been driven from their homes. We pray for all those who are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world. And today we especially pray for all the pastors who are serving in Ukraine under very uh, dire and sometimes dangerous circumstances. We pray that you would provide them with all they need to do the work you are calling them to do. We pray that you would give them courage and strength. And we pray that you would work in and through them to love and serve the people they come into contact with. Lord, on this Father's Day, we lift up all fathers and we thank you, Lord, for our earthly fathers. And uh, we pray for all those who are fathers. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, guide them and encourage them that you would uh, comfort them when they uh, become aware of their failings. Uh, we pray that you would uh, bless them and help them to uh, model your fatherly love for us. And we pray that you would help each of us to uh, give honor and love uh, toward our fathers so that they may be encouraged in the role that you have given to them. We pray for all those who are grieving. We pray for Genevieve and her family who are grieving the deaths of three family members who died in a fatal accident on Thursday north of Kamloops. We pray for the family and friends of Sharon S. who are grieving her death. We lift up Rhonda and her family who are grieving the death of her grandma. And for others who we know are grieving, we now name in our hearts before you. Dear Jesus, we thank you for dying for us on the cross and rising again to give us the sure and certain promise of resurrection life. We pray that you would wrap your arms of love around all who are grieving 
and comfort them with your presence and your promise of life eternal with you. We pray, Lord, for all those who are going through a difficult time and need an extra measure of your rest, comfort, encouragement, and strength. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Earl and Marion and their family and with Otto and Shauna, and that you would, by your presence, Lord, um, guide, direct, lead, and encourage them and provide what is needed for the path that lays ahead. Bless them, Lord, we pray. We pray for all those who are in need of your healing touch, for two-year-old Adonai, who's in critical condition at VGH, for Dave S.'s sister, Christine, who is recovering from surgery to remove her thyroid due to thyroid cancer, for uh, Christine, a different Christine, who has been diagnosed with liver and colon cancer. For Dave S.'s dad, Henry, who has lung cancer and is, in now, is now in hospital. For Nimrit, who is healing from brain surgery. For Jake, who has a long journey of recovery ahead. Uh, for Ryan V., who is healing from uh, surgery on his knee. And uh, for others who we know need your healing touch, including Rita E., Rachel, Maddie, Corey P., Marlene, Lori, Lori G., that is, uh, Bob J., Glenn P., Elizabeth P., Julianne L., Pastor Carl, Lynn, and Ruth H. And for others who we know need your healing touch, we now name before you in the silence of our hearts. Dear Lord, you are the great physician and the source of all healing whenever it happens. And so we pray that you would strengthen our loved ones, both in body and in spirit, and help them to know that you are always with them, that you always love them, and that they are forever safe with you. Lord, we pray all of our spoken and silent prayers in Jesus' name, and we pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So now our uh, service will continue with Holy Ghost. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Bye. 